little right there we go <laughs> okay. um hi everyone thank you so much for coming out um, i'm amy johnson i'm the co-executive director with the federation of worker cooperatives and um so thank you to the east bay community law center for hosting us in the space tonight um and anyone on the phone or in the future, hello, hello. Um, <laughs> what we so um, thank you for taking time out of your week to come here. What we're we're really excited because um, men, some of you might know, but this has been in some iterations around how can we um, advocate for worker cooperatives here in California. And one of the ideas has been about this whole co-op statute piece. Um, how can we kind of raise legitimacy of worker cooperatives? Um, and have a way for folks to plug in and start them, um, or grow them, and all of that great stuff. Um, I'm going to just do a quick introduction. I'm actually going to hand it over to Delaney, who's going to do our presentation. Um, and then we're just going to basically like run through, run through what we're what, what's being proposed, and um, and leave most of it for questions and discussion and feedback. And so um, I'll do some facilitation. Delaney's going to do the presentation. Um, the intention here was, you know, so the, the East Bay Community Law Center, the Sustainable Economies Law Center, and the um, Democracy Work Institute, which is the Federation's kind of nonprofit partner, um, and several other key players like Ayers Mendy Association has been in the room and some other folks throughout this process. Um, so we, so the Federation is kind of hosting this as a way to get our members and get worker owners um, input and and questions and so that's the primary focus here is really around um, yeah, making sure that our members that the Federation members are um, involved in this know about it and ask your questions offer your feedback and ultimately we we hope to get your support um, on you know get your input to make any final revisions and then hopefully we can get your support to pass this through um, the state legislator so with that, I think if we can just do a quick go around in the room before we hand it over to Delaney, just so we know who's here, if everyone would just mind, you know, yeah, um, who you are, and either if you're if you're a worker owner at a co-op, it would be great to, to hear where you're coming in from, and um, if you're not a worker owner, it would be great just to, you know, if you're with another organization or what brings you here tonight. Um, we'll just do a quick round robin and then keep it moving. So, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Go around this way. Yeah. I'm uh, Ricardo Nunez from the Sustainable Economies Law Center, and um, sorry, what were the questions? That's <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Mark Swan. I just closed our local co-op uh, um, last year, and I was involved in the first, the first iteration of this process and trying to develop develop this. It didn't quite happen, so I'm excited to see how it's going to do. Christina Oakfield from the Sustainable Economies Law Center. I'm Sarah Stevens from the Sustainable Economies Law Center. I'm Emily from Box Dog Bikes, a cooperative bike shop. I'm Jeff Ray from Rainbow Grocery and then Debbie Books and Arts Co-op. Neil Hope, an attorney, um, representing cooperatives. And I first proposed the cooperative work, uh, worker cooperative statute in 1993 and again in 1995. Uh, Terry Beard, most recently with the uh, Richmond Worker Cooperative Loan Fund and uh, with the Mayor's Office. I'm Rob Yanagida. I'm with the National Lawyers Guild. I'm Nina. I'm from Earth Men 883 in Oakland. I'm John Nicholas. Hi, I'm uh, David Carl Salvary. I'm a licensed general contractor, but I'm also helping run a uh, progressive campaign in San Francisco for Mayor. <laughs> I'm Sushi Hanekov, and I'm an attorney here at the Law Center. Okay. I'm Tim Thayer, and I'm in Development Sport Co-op. And I'm Lily, and I'm 3L at Berkeley Walsh, and I'm an attorney at the Green College Candidates Clinic. I'll be presenting on the Office of Statute. Great. And do we have anybody on the phone? Just... No? Okay. Great. So we're just recording this also because there's folks that were really interested in and couldn't make it tonight. So um, they're going to get a really great long PowerPoint presentation and me staring at the screen. Um, so, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it over. And if we are going to have plenty of time for, for kind of questions and discussion. So if folks want to just kind of jot down um, what your questions are, we will definitely get into them. And then I'll facilitate the staff and I'll you. So hand it over. And thank you so much for doing the presentation. Cool. Is there anyone also in the room who hasn't gotten a copy of the actual statute? Um, do you want to close the window? Are there still students here? 
Um, so this is going to be a pretty short presentation. I like to make most of the time for this session. That's really the point of this meeting to get everyone to speak back on what we've been doing. So I'll start with the background of the existing co-op law and why we've proposed an amendment to it. We'll do a really quick overview of the new provisions, just like a bullet point list of everything that we're changing. And I've picked a few provisions for um, to highlight for discussion amongst the group. So right now, I'm sure most, if not all of you know, that the current cooperative law in California is a consumer cooperative corporation statute. So there are a few reasons why it falls short for worker cooperatives in particular. The name is a little misleading. It really is used for uh, as used in general cooperative statute. There are no guidelines for creating worker cooperatives. And one of the things that we really like to do is create new security, security exemptions for worker costs to help them build capital and start up pieces. So first, we'd be changing the name of the Consumer Co-op Corporation Statute to the General Co-op Corporation Statute. And we would clarify that it applies to consumer co-ops, worker co-ops, and, um, and other cooperatives. Pretty simple. Our definition of a worker cooperative is also quite simple. It's a corporation formed under the co-op statute that includes a class of worker members and whose patronage consists of labor, personal services for, or other work performed for the corporation. And the labor contributed to is for the worker co-ops. So under the statute, a co-op formed under the general cooperative corporation statute would elect to be a worker cooperative by stating so in their Articles of Incorporation or their amended articles. They could also elect to be governed by a collective board, which is when there's only one class of members, that's the worker class, and all the worker members are on the board. Um, one of the benefits of this is that it can ease up on meeting requirements for small worker co-ops where all the worker members are board members, so there wouldn't have to be a special meeting of the members. So we got some financial provisions in the law just to clarify uh, what a worker co-op is entitled to do. Um, none of these are terribly new. They're, for the most part, pulled from the Massachusetts Worker Co-op Law. One of the more interesting things that we'd be doing is kind of expanding the definition of labor as patronage. It would include personal services contributed, including wages earned, number of hours worked. Those are pretty typical definitions of labor as patronage. But it would also allow co-ops to include a measure of seniority in the co-op, or a number of jobs created, or, or some combination of the above. And next, the netting and losses. Sorry, I didn't know that she um, Netting earnings and losses, pretty typical. They're apportioned to members. And it includes the definition of a capital account cooperative, which is pretty much how worker co-ops are currently run. It's just codifying, sorry, it's just codifying the existing practices of worker co-ops and putting it into the statute where people will be able to see it and follow it. Another slight change we'd make is to reduce knowing, notice for number meetings. Currently, you have to give 10 days notice for member meetings, which makes sense if your patronage class is uh, as spread out as a consumer class. But for worker members, where you come into work every day, it makes sense to have a shorter meeting 
uh, notice requirement, so we shorten it to 30, 48 hours. We would tweak the suspension and termination provisions. So right now in the consumer co-op statute, it treats suspension and termination exactly the same. So for worker co-ops, we would allow an immediate suspension of a worker with an opportunity to be heard after that as long as, um, sorry, we'd require, we'd allow an immediate suspension with opportunity to be heard after that, but we would keep the same termination provisions which require a 15 days notice. And there are a few additions we would add to the regarding change of control events, which the consumer co-op statute does not currently address. Um, a worker cooperative would only be able to merge with another worker cooperative. And we would just add that upon dissolution and demutualization, the unallocated capital shall be distributed to members based on patronage, capital contribution, or some combination of the above. The reason we include capital contribution is because we anticipate that there might be investments in the worker cooperativeness that's being started up. And one of the more interesting things we're trying to add is a provision for indivisible reserves. And an indivisible reserve account is an account that the cooperative can use for, for general capital, but upon dissolution of the co-op, it can only go to future cooperative projects. So it wouldn't be distributed to the members upon dissolution. It would go to a, a federation, a U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops or a regional federation, and become this revolving cooperative development fund. It's being used in, in a number of European countries and in Central America, but it hasn't really caught on in the U.S. yet. And, okay, that was a, a whirlwind overview of most of the co-op statute. And I have two points that I flagged for discussion that were not that are still open to be formulated in different ways. And the first is power in the structure, the voting power in a worker cooperative. So there are three options. <laughs> Option one, a worker co-op can include additional patron member classes, so it can be a multi-stakeholder co-op with a consumer class and a worker class. They can have a class of preferred membership, which would be um, members who contribute to the co-op but do not receive patronage from the co-op, such as investor members or nonprofits that are helping to develop the co-op. But the worker member class must have at least 51% voting power to be considered a worker cooperative. The second option is to also allow multiple member classes but only distribute patronage to the worker member class. And again, worker members would have to have at least 51% of the voting power. These, these are pretty similar options. But then on the other side, we have a, a, a scheme where the worker cooperative only has one class of members, and that's the worker member class, without any other classes, no investors or consumers. And if a co-op wants to form as a multi-stakeholder co-op, it would form under the general, the general corporation. Cooperative Corporation statute. And we wanted to see how people, where people fall on the spectrum. Maybe, maybe we can, so if we've done the whole overview, maybe we can hold, we know where the next conversation is going to go. But maybe we could just open it up for some questions, just more broadly okay. about. The, let me just do, let me tee up the next, the second. So we know where the discussion is going to Great which is going to be about the securities exceptions and exemptions. Currently, there is a securities a exception for 
all um, in the consumer co-op statute up to um, a member can contribute up to $300 without it being, being considered a security. And we want to increase that to $1,000. Um, we would want to increase that exception for worker cooperatives to $5,000. And we would like to create a securities exclusion so that a worker cooperative with a collective board would be excluded from securities regulation in the same way that managing directors in the LLC are excluded from securities regulation. And, and yeah, we'd like to hear what people think about these numbers, about the, about the exclusion and the securities commissions in general. Mm -hmm. So we throw a lot of information at you. Um, and so we try to spin this out ahead of time so you can actually have it. But I think I think what would be helpful to start is I'm sure folks definitely like have opinions on stuff, but if we can maybe grab any clarifying questions first. So if people just kind of have like, what does it actually mean or how would this work, you know? Um, if we let's let's start with kind of question stuff because I think things might get answered and then and then we'll really we'll we've got two discussions and of course we want to see the feedback. So, I'm going to see Scott, and I see one. Yeah. If 51% of the uh, worker cooperatives have that 51% membership, mm -hmm. worker members, who are the other 49%? It could be investors, it could be consumers, it could be um, other, other classes of members. So, you could have 49% of people who have an investment interest? Yes. Okay. Great. Terry, and sorry if that you guys have any so tap me on the shoulder or anything. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure that I'm current on uh, top law, but uh, <clears throat> the consumer top law was an appendage to the broader top law that included farmer co-ops at one time. I don't know if that's still the case. Uh, and so I'm trying to figure out where all this fits in because we <clears throat> oh, you're supplanting the consumer co-op law with the broader uh, law that includes worker co-ops, right? So, so actually, are we referencing like farmer co-ops in this at all? No. Yeah, go ahead. No. My understanding is that ag co-ops are a completely different statute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the consumer co-op statute is in the corporation's code. It's, um, and I, I honestly have no idea where the ag co-op statute is. In the ag code. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so what we'd be doing is creating like a subsection. We would it would be first we would rename the consumer co-op statute the general cooperative statute, mm -hmm. and then we would create a, like a subsection for worker cooperatives. And if you elect to be a worker cooperative, the following provisions would apply to you. Okay. So I'm trying to make other examples of co-ops, like hodad co-ops or fishing co-ops or whatever would be under ag. <coughs> Actually, is a separate statute for fishing cooperatives. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it follows the consumer co op. It's one right next to it. And mm -hmm. All right. So this would be consumer co ops and worker co ops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So, say, an average member, I've got a $500 capital contribution. How does, how does uh, an, uh, the current law and the $300 securities exemption that affect, affect me in real, real terms? Securities exemption is kind of a rarefied language. Yeah. People don't understand what it means. Something just in real terms. Um, Sushil, would you mind answering So your question is if you have a $500 member contribution? Right. You, right, you just told me there was a $300 yeah. limit. Mm -hmm. So I got my, got my capital contribution is $500. But the list three hundred dollars. What does that? How does that affect me in the real terms? And then you use that to maybe explain largely what securities law means. Well. Securities law uh, generally it protects investors. So um, the purpose of securities law is to protect investors from companies that are issuing investment opportunities that may be um, basically fleecing the, the public. And so you generally need to uh, register that investment with either the the state if you're only offering to residents of the state or with the federal agency which is the SEC if you're going to do uh, cross states and the co-op law has a specific exemption from the registration requirement in California of up to $300 so you can op offer your members 
um, 300, they, can, they can invest up to $300 as their membership in the co-op, and that's exempt from the registration requirement in California. So if you had a $500 requirement, then you would need to um, rely on some other exemption. You could, up to $300 of that could be exempt, but then the other 200 would have to rely on some other exemption, or you'd have to register that whole thing. Let's see. But wouldn't most cooperatives that we're aware of be subject to exemptions that are available to you know, corporations generally? Uh, the exemption and other exemptions that are provided wouldn't apply to most of them? Are, there are very few other exemptions. There's a limited offering exemption and a small offering exemption that are provided. And then there's an exclusion for managing directors of LLCs as well as for directors and officers of corporations. Um, and for accredited investors as well. But that's for people. So no, there's not like for widespread securities offerings. You really just have to either have to register or take advantage of this three hundred dollar securities exemption. Emily, did I see you right? No. Okay. So I mean, this may sound weird, but uh, some of the language seems to pertain to like to starting some of some of these things. Uh, with like new co-ops that start under this law and some of it seemed to pertain to changing basically the law and thus like, the, what would be in the bylaws of co-ops. Is that true? I think it's a great question. <laughs> maybe, and maybe that a larger question to talk about. No, no, it's a good question. Which okay. I think is like maybe how does, how, how would this impact the six box of this currently under the consumer co-op section, right? Mm -hmm. So like what, like in just real terms, what happens if this goes through, mm -hmm. Um, I can, you know, but yeah. if it goes through, what, what does Boxdown want to do, or how do they interact with this? Um, Boxdown could, could continue to operate under the existing consumer co-op law, where it would be called now the general co-op law, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't have to make any changes. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to take advantage of the additional securities exemptions and other exemptions, for example, from your annual meeting requirement, you would get that additional benefit if you elected to be a worker co-op. Okay, so we would have to then change? Only if you um, wanted to. You don't have to do anything oh, okay. at all. But you so can just, you know, how would they do that? Like they would how would you do the, the election? You don't amend your bylaws. You amend, You have to amend your articles of incorporation that are part of the state. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. And you would also amend your bylaws, but the main thing is you have to amend your articles. And can you tell us how easy or difficult amending your articles are? Uh, it's, I mean, it's paperwork mm -hmm. and there's a uh, form you have to file with the state, and there's a filing fee. Um, I, I feel it like don't. It wouldn't be that difficult. Though. Mm -hmm. no. okay. mm -hmm. it, does that get another question? Uh, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, for sure. Great, great. Okay, so we had a question over here. Just back for a second to the 5149. Somebody else asked a question about uh, in terms of the you know investors. Uh, I can imagine a situation where you know, maybe the workers were split in terms of you know where they wanted to go to the board of directors, and if the investors were all you know in, on one page, and there were 49% of them versus 51 percent of the workers split into different. You do have some discussion about maybe raising the number uh, to uh, two thirds, one third, or something, or yeah. Definitely. Did anybody else want to answer this question? <laughs> um, yes, we did have a lot of discussion about this point. Um, we ultimately landed on this is the law for all co-ops, and it's up to the individual co-op in their bylaws to um, have a higher threshold. Oh, okay. So, okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can I actually add one thing? Sorry, like half an Um I think one one thing that I didn't know if it came across was just that you could incorporate into this as a worker co-op, and you don't have to have any other members. You don't have to have any investors. Yeah. So it's really just, a, it's, we're trying to create the flexibility so mm -hmm. that folks can do different things, but um, there's nothing that says, you know, so it's just you would have to have 49%. Of, it's, it's a floor, basically. You can't go lower exactly. than 51%. Right? That's right. That's okay. a floor. Mm -hmm. And when we say 51%, we mean the voting power, which is the power to uh, elect the board mm -hmm. and um, make decisions when there's a, a vote sent to the members for matters that are sent to the members for a vote. So it's not the number of people actually in the co-op. It can be yeah. three working members and 500 people. Exactly. And the three working members have 51% control of the board. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see.
I don't know the language thing, and I'm, I'm totally a, a lay person at this, and it's in uh, the actual um, financial provisions definition of labor and pay and patronage. Mm -hmm. I understand patronage as a form of payout, you know, uh, but it's confusing to me on um, uh, a the corporation is organized as a worker cooperative. The corporations and patrons are the worker members because I think patrons can also be shoppers, consumers, and, and it, it, it kind of is confusing because we're trying to get away from the language of consumer cooperatives. Mm -hmm. So patrons and patronage are, are different. They're just different. Um, so it would be nice if there was more a defining line between the two, mm -hmm. and that maybe there's another, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, that's confusing me. Mm -hmm. I'm an English major. Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree that it's confusing. It really shook me up when I first started learning about co-ops. But I think that this is just how um, how the language of cooperatives has evolved, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that problem is that the federal tax law is written with consumer mm -hmm. cooperatives really in mind. Mm -hmm. And so if we try to not use that language, <laughs> we wouldn't match up with their language. Mm -hmm. so in some ways, some of the things are suggesting things that would be stretching what the current federal law might be, but to use language different than what they use would be confusing to them, at least. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I just, just give you a definition of patron and worker as a worker. Patron and a consumer cooperative is a consumer. Mm -hmm. But maybe that could even be in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it could be in there. Right. That, that, that simple sentence. Okay. You know, I don't care. I, yeah. I don't know if it has it. And is this, I mean, maybe I'm actually going to definition of what? I want a, I got a little uh, intro music for my question. Um, what it's saying, what, it's, what this is saying is for the whole statute is. Hey, when you see patron elsewhere in this statute, and if it's talking about a worker co-op, that patron means worker owner. Right? Is that what it's yeah. trying to say? If you see patron throughout mm -hmm. the statute? Because otherwise, yeah. Um, I invite other people to correct me if I'm wrong, but in theory, that you could have people who were workers who weren't worker members as patrons. Mm -hmm. Good. Under the tax law. Um, and Mark was raising his hand behind you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, in the first round of this one, one of the, the points that came up was how do we how do we make sure that this 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 law isn't um, uh, the advantages of this law are used to, ex, uh, to exploit workers? And um, I wonder to what degree you. It seems like the um, much definition of what constitutes being a worker corporate in terms of how profits are shared, what the, the maximum wage differential would be, um, just the, and how, you've, how you've tried to hold the line to making this efficient and simple uh, to, to understand and even not to do with labor law, but at the same time um, not be a way to have a regular corporation say, oh, I like that idea, I'll like, oh, some of that, and it's not going to affect me. Because I'm gonna have working out and get out two working members that's gonna be in my life. Are you asking what's in here to protect or are you well, uh, I'm unseen yeah. and I wonder why. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, I can give it one reason why. Um, we wanted to start with a simple bill that would not um, raise too many feathers and not put in much enforcement <laughs> at all. In fact, there's no enforcement. As I was saying, if you're a worker co-op and, and you don't want to switch over to the law, you don't have to. If you do form as a, a, a worker co-op under this law, there's no enforcement of the definition of worker co-op. There's no agency that's going to say you don't meet this definition of worker co-op. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to avoid a lot of that kind of language because we just want to get something established right now. The boss would require T from T for five Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would take oh. a little bit issue with that issue and definition because I think one of the things you want to work up to, and I'll talk to you more about security regulation, is I think I think you're somewhat misdirected in the exemption. I think what you want to do is create a safe harbor in terms of when cooperatives will not be subject to put to securities. I have some case law. 
and um, use, but in order to get there, I think you have to create a foundation, which is strictly a definitional statute. And, and I could talk, if, <clears throat> I'd like to talk for a second or two about the strategy that arose from the original bill, because I think it's still pertinent today. I was advised by a legislative assistant, again, in 1993, to draft this legislation so there would be a familiarity with the legislature, because just before that, I had done a report for the University of Davis on labor law, and I found out that most of the people in state government do not do law cooperatives. Mm -hmm. So the objective was, was to create a footprint, a knowledge, a political base, and then work up the ladder. So the strategy then was to have strictly a definitional statute, which would not require a hearing. It would go through the Judiciary Committee, and, and again, if you're going with an exemption, you're going to have hearings, and I'll talk about that mm -hmm. later. So I think that's an undue complication. The next step would be then to address security matters, maybe an exemption, or maybe better yet, create a safe harbor based upon case law, which shows that worker cooperatives, if properly structured, should not be subject to security law at all. And again, there's case law and statutory support for that. Then the third thing, once you build up that constituency, is to get to the much, much more difficult issue, which is labor law. And when I wrote the uh, article in 1992, I've since litigated a number of cases. In fact, uh, I, I just filed a complaint against EDB on, by, on violations of the 14th Amendment. But I have seen a whole lot since. Mm -hmm. And believe me, there is a real need to rectify the issue of labor law, which you're not going to get up there unless you build things up sequentially. And frankly, I think we've wasted a lot of time, because I think if we picked up where things should have been 20 years ago, maybe today we would be on our way to really write some proper labor law. So I think the first step should be strictly a definitional statute. Okay. Um, and I'll address, I'll address the security issue later after other people talk. Okay. Great. Um, Jeff, I had some Okay. Any other provisions? Hi, welcome, <clears throat> Number nine, indivisible. Reserve B. Um, can that mean that it could be a rainy day fund for the corporation? For the, for the, for the cooperative? Yes. Yeah. It's operating well, capital for the cooperative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, John. This, um, I'm just wondering what uh, the accountability is for in that same cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, so, on the solution in the business of those, and should be allocated to international cooperative and international federation. I'm just wondering, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I'm just wondering, like, people are what that would be and mm -hmm. what kind of say, you know, the small thoughts might have and who that money goes to. Because I, I don't know how to define something like that, but I would also like, some say in what happens in our organization pre and mm -hmm. um, say, you know, hundred thousand dollars to just keep us you know, up on this. So if that that to me sounds somewhat shady <laughs> a little bit, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. so So I think the language about individual individual reserves right now is largely aspirational. There's nothing requiring co-ops to keep money at the individual reserve right before they dissolve or emerge. Um, but it's something that we that seems to have worked very well in other countries with a larger co-op presence. And we would like to introduce this into the co-op lexicon. And that, that's our main goal, introducing this, the individual reserves into this mm -hmm. uh, bill. Do you have does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, my concern isn't that the reserves are not created, it's just that particular section has some kind of consequence for where the money will go eventually. Mm -hmm. So we keep that have any pre, you know, beforehand relationship with mm -hmm. contact with. And so I, I would, if, if that, I mean, I, I support the move from some of I'm just worried about how that money eventually gets distributed. And, um, you know, now, obviously, there's no key, like you said, but I also mm -hmm. want it to be something like that. So, just to clarify, what this doesn't say is that the co op decides who to give that 
money to on dissolution. So the language that we have in the, the bill language is is a ICA approved national federation or regional body in the state designated in the articles or bylaws. So the co-op itself would be deciding which body it will go to. Right, I think that's the key, right? So it's, it's not required the co-op to choose to do it. To create it. To create it in the first place. And the co-op can write into our bylaws who or what organization that might be. Um, and then I think the idea was if the bylaws don't say anything, but the, if the co-op elects to have the most indivisible reserve cap, but does not designate it, then this language, the ICA group, they not designated body, would apply, right? Yeah, and, and we probably have to actually name it. Right, but we wanted it to get to the co-op. And so I have two on the snap back there. And and, oh, I'm sorry. I can wait. Wait, wait yeah, I'm sorry. You were first. Sorry. Okay. Just a couple of things. I used to work at a good working co-op, and, and uh, typically a wood shop has about $100,000 worth of equipment. So I'm not sure if the securities exemption of 5000 would be high enough for a, you know, for a typical wood shop. I mean, you have three members, that's 33 grand each. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there, is that a, that's, that's, a, that's a limit, right? And then, so if, if you, if you had, let's say, a situation where there's, let's say, 35,000 in round numbers, I uh, get a $5,000 exemption on the, on the other 30,000 years, you would have to do what? You would have to be a working cooperative with a collective board, in which case you would qualify for an exclusion um, from securities um, registration entirely. As long as you have the Which is board. analogous to the exemption, the exclusion that currently applies to managing directors and LLCs. And then I couldn't just tag on one other question that's probably inappropriate right now, but uh, do you guys have a political sponsor already in uh, Sacramento? Uh, Can you tell us who it is or is it? Rob Bonta. And he is a whole assembly or assembly? He is a member. Bonta. 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 You, you said the judiciary? Uh, he's yeah, he did banking and finance. He did that 23 years ago. Oh, okay. So he's on banking and finance. He did that the right committee. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, that's the correct committee? To, in what sense? To go to the legislation forward. Is, yeah, he's on the committee that it's going to go to. Mm -hmm. no. We also have this, this sort of this district just mm -hmm. south of us by a few blocks, like Oakland, San Leandro, Alameda. Is he just involved? Is he the only person you have so far? Um, so far. We have so a far. list of other potential like co-authors, but I don't think we want to confirm yet. Okay, great. So now we'll go back to the yeah. Okay. So, okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 I'll wait. Okay. I, I just want to, number one, I want to kind of respond to something you said that there's no definitional law uh, for cooperatives, and indeed there is. Uh, I want to refer you to the Puget Sound case, the tax court case in 1965, which pretty much outlines uh, the operational characteristics of cooperatives. And look at subchapter G both the, uh, the uh, statutes and the regulations. And in line with what Tim said, uh, if we're creating definitions, we want them to be consistent with the federal language and the federal concepts. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think, you know, if, if you want to create your definition of statute, uh, I, I think it should be consistent with what already exists, and that you should take your key from the existing definitions. Um, I'm going to come back later on the security issue, but I'd like to see what's up. I'm just curious, um, under state statutes, the um, definition you have under um, what could be considered patronage, um, how, does, how does that compare to other state statutes? Um, I'm just curious if any of the things listed are not comparable to other statutes. I'm just curious how the things you have listed. Have they all stood up like under this audit? So I mean, are some of those being pushing potential? So the ones that are um, kind of pushing the IRS definition of patronage are the seniority of the co-op, number of jobs created, and um, yeah, just those two. But um, services contributed, wages earned, and hours worked. I, believe are quite typical. The reason we want to include the other two is exactly to push the boundary of the IRS definition of patronage and the currently understood definition of patronage to um, 
Chicken Burger Cops. Um, more flexibility in um, kind of rewarding or acknowledging seniority and giving those senior members incentive to create liquor clubs so they will be your be rewarded in some way in the future. Tim, I think you've explained this much better than I just did, if you wouldn't mind. I'm not sure I have. No. <laughs> Um, well, we want to make sure that nothing we pass in California contradicts the existing law, especially federal tax law, because that would get us in trouble and people who are forming co-ops might form their co-ops in a way that they didn't realize was going to contradict federal law. But federal law is actually pretty silent on a lot of things to do with worker co-ops. As, as Neil said, there are a couple of cases, and is one of the big cases. Um, but most of the law is written in really vague terms, and all the decisions are really the made of consumer cooperatives, not all the decisions, but most of them. So there are areas where they've, they've approved wages, they've approved gross wages, approved hours, but they haven't spoken against using job created or some of these other things. So what we want to do is suggest it on the state level and hope that that will, whenever it does get litigated on the federal level, be of help. Because uh, a number of us actually think that hours and wages strictly is a very, it's actually one of the things that's kept the cooperative from growing. Because it actually um, punishes growth in cooperatives. If you try to create new jobs, you actually invest a lot of money and you don't ever get it back. Whereas you should actually see that the people who invest in those jobs, at least get the eye investment back instead of get punished for creating new jobs. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the approach that we're taking. We try to very carefully not contradict federal law. So if, for instance, we said take money that would be taken and put it in an invisible account, that probably would contradict federal law. So we just say, oh, the, the money that's not taken do that. So that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do, suggest certain things that hopefully we'll win on a federal level as well. Mm -hmm. And actually, if I can actually just ask, you know, as this is one of the things that could could really impact the worker owners, like if you guys could just let us, like, how does that land? You know, I hate to put you on the spot, but that's, came here, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> but it would just be great to know, you know, if that uh, resonates, if that uh, doesn't, you know, um, you know, if anyone wants to jump in, that's cool, but I know really put you on the spot. I'll just say one thing, I'm yeah. just, you know, just about, like, about founders' bonuses or, you know, something along those lines. I support there being some way, some mechanism for it. Um, so. You're talking about rewarding people who began a cooperative and then after it's built up. Yeah, and I'm just asking worker owners on their perspective of, it, of expanding the way that they could formulate their future or how the weighted hours that the IRS allows for. That was in the Lenny case, I think they allowed weighted hours. Right, and, but we're, we're just asking now, like, how, you know, if we add it on, like, seniority and co op, whenever a job is created, does that resonate with your, you know, like your reference? And, again, I would stick to a definition of statute. I totally understand. I'm just genuinely asking how this resonates for folks. And that doesn't mean that we have to go with it, but I'm, I'm just, it's something that's been talked about in the community for a while, and we haven't had a chance to kind of ask it. So, Jeff, do you have? If I, I might be totally off mark, but if it's number of jobs created is, is part of the patronage, and if number of jobs created is a, if you get a government, um, if, if, if you get money for creating jobs, if, if like a grant for creating jobs is part of that, then I can see that, but it's, it's very like, like, I work for Rainbow Grocery creating jobs, who creates the jobs? It, it, it's like, you can yeah. be there for nine months and create if someone to, you know, be on the, mm -hmm. on the hiring committee. So it's very, it's confusing, but however, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't know where the extra money comes from for creating jobs. Wait, do you, I'm just going to go, I guess this is just clarifying. These are just ways you could calculate patronage in your worker cooperative. So if your cooperative didn't want to do that, you wouldn't have to, but if you wanted to incentivize creating jobs, and the idea would be that if you created jobs, then you would be getting more capital flowing into your business, too, potentially. So it's just a way, I think, of um, allowing people to structure their cooperatives to uh, <clears throat> divvy up patronage that way. I think that's it. Is, is it part of the same? Yes, it's exactly the same yeah. point. It's kind of the same question. I don't get 
how I, I, I'm understanding the D uh, what it does is it gives certain worker members more money or less money depending on how many hours they put in, blah, blah, blah. But so if a worker member creates a new day job, then that particular worker member gets, um, yeah. you know, more, I, it's, it's confusing. Uh, or but because usually the entire cooperative creates jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think it's I understand it's confusion that you have mm -hmm. or somewhere. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that's how it would be defined. It wouldn't be a particular person in the business because they're on the hiring committee or the CEO is said to create the job. Um, so let me give an example and I'll use Rainbow as maybe an example. Say Rainbow the proposal came up to create East Bay Rainbow. Um, Nice to be a member of Rainbow, and I think what would have come up pretty quickly was, well, what would I do to our patronage? And the answer would be is that even if we create another business that creates just as many jobs and is just as successful, we'll have invested a lot of money that we could have distributed to ourselves, and we'll actually get no more money per member. So we'll, even though we're successful in that way and creating jobs, we'll actually lose money. We'll be punished for creating those jobs. So instead, you could have a system that said, well, it's not that just someone who happened to be lucky because we created that job gets that job and they get just as much per hour as we do, just working the same hours. We actually get recognized for the fact that out of these 200 people, we share, create 200 jobs. So it's not that I get 200 shares. I would get basically one share of each of those jobs. So I get a second share, you know, 200 jobs divided by 200 people. I create only one job on average. So instead of new people coming in just getting this windfall, we recognize that these people who made the decision and invested what they created a surplus, will start to get that back before these other folks would get that money. So that's really more the idea. But mm -hmm. as, as you said, co-op wouldn't have to choose that. It would just give them the option to do that. And some co-ops, they don't even want to grow. But the current system doesn't doesn't allow you the, the option mm -hmm. to say, we're a, job, we're a job creating cooperative. That's what we're trying to do. And we want to reward the people who make the decisions to create those jobs and take those risks and make that second class and short. Yeah, sir. So. And that's kind of on kind of a tangent, but I would like the state to reward. And I, I know that the state rewards <coughs> corporations sometimes for creating jobs. But it would be nice if, the, if, the, if you align the language of what we're talking about and it actually is matched by a process that the state and, and um, you know, rats give us rats. So, and that may be the language of creating that. They look at it and say, oh, you, you do have a system, so you should get a reward. And, and I, that's where I think that patronage should be distributed if there is a grant that goes towards that. Can we back? And then, um, just not yeah, okay. No, I didn't see anything else before you, and then we'll go to you. Yeah. Sorry, guys, just behind the search. So, a couple things. One is, I, I agree, I'd like to see the state. I, I have this kind of thing where I don't really want to become dependent on government, but I also do think that we are a more favorable business for communities. This would be a step toward the owner to recognize that there was such a thing as a worker co op, and then maybe we can go to cities and regional bodies and try to get procurement laws and everything to favor co op. Yeah, yeah. So that's something we can build towards. Mm -hmm. And I also want to agree with um, Neil's definitional point. Um, the assumption when you write things like that is that unless you have this exemption, there is no other argument. And I certainly would prefer the argument, which is essentially implicit in this last point, bullet point, which is they're not passive securities if you're actively involved in the business. And so it shouldn't be considered a, uh, securing it. We don't need an exemption. That by definition isn't it. We might have a hard time getting an unlimited exemption for people who are members of businesses who aren't on the board of directors. And that's why I think I just imagined why it's 5,000. I would like to shoot for something more than that, but there wouldn't be any limit. But um, that might be something we could plot, try to see what the legislature are. Committee member says, you know, do you think we can get that passed? If not, something less ambitious would be better. But in the definition saying that it doesn't even need an exemption, it's not secure in the first place, would be preferable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to go to, uh, sorry, just a question. Oh, we're going to go to Neil, and then if both of you have any more, I mean, you want clarifying questions or feedback stuff, and then I want to make sure we have enough time for two discussions. So um, grab the more questions. Yeah, go for it. Okay, for the very rationalization, which um, is told why they should not be. 
why cooperatives should not be subject to security law. Let me refer you to the case of the federal case, Rosenberg, 447, Fed Sup number one. So it's an interesting case, which exactly for that purpose, and it held that where the this was a marketing flaw, where the purchase of stock are motivated to use what they have produced and not to generate a profit, the security laws do not apply. I've also litigated the issue of what is a security and what is not, and another way to address it is through the risk element. And again, if you have a membership system, which some or all that portion of that membership fee goes into it, that's your first entry in the internal capital account or maybe an undivided corporate account. But if it's a set fee not based upon any type of uh, internal wealth or net worth, net worth of the corporation or its performance, then you should be exempt from security law entirely. And I think the emphasis should be not creating an exemption because you're going to have to make the case this is going to make a difference in terms of the formation and continuation of cooperatives, and I don't believe you have the evidence. I don't believe that you can show because people are going to get this exemption, somehow we're going to have more cooperatives. I just don't think you can make that case. So I think what you what would be a smarter, strategic way, have a definition based for the most part upon federal law, then upon that definition build up, go for the security exemption, go for labor law. Okay. Yeah, oh, let me just say one thing real quick. I, I've also represented a lot of contractors mm -hmm. and a lot of corporations. And not one of them have had a register for security. So I mean, most small businesses, they, they don't, they're not involved. But that's not what happens in real life. I feel like just to respond to that, if yeah. we're going to be creating a law, we're not going to be based on the fact that a lot of small businesses are not in compliance with the law as a justification for us not worrying about it either. No, no but my point is what's the need? You're going to have to show a crime need. I don't think you can do it. You can't show that. This is going to make, make a material difference. I know. I mean, we could keep going around this one. No, I just, I just yeah. made my point. No, thank you. And I think it's, I mean, this is exactly why we want to get as yeah. many kind of ideas on the table so that then we can kind of test them out and move them around to the future. Um, so I just want to, I, we do have kind of these two discussion topics which we, you know, just wanted to make sure that we brought up. So, touched on them, but just to, is there any other, um, John, I have respect to take any more feedback questions, thoughts, before we do any soon discussion? Mark. 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 So Mark, well, I guess to Mark, with this I'm a little concerned about it. there's nothing uh, specifically stating that <coughs> um, the co-op needs a majority of worker members to be considered a worker co-op. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, somebody brought up an example of three people applying a worker co-op and they might have been so people. So mm -hmm. that would still fall on the definition as it's right. been Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and I feel like, yeah, I, I feel like we, We're working from uh, sort of like the shadows element that people don't know who we are. And I feel like if, if things like that were to happen, it would really do a disservice to yeah. all the hard work that we do. So I, I would like to see a little more protection for like what we're actually talking about, which is that people are actually contributing as workers to a particular business, and that's why it's called a worker co op. Mm -hmm. Say three or four businesses start up, and then do some shit like some stuff that might not seem. Mm -hmm. Um, above board or some of these things. I feel like that would really do a disservice to all the hard work that people put into it. And then, you know, and I think a little bit of bad press goes a lot further than any of us. So, but to me, I would like to see something that's really maybe good as us for my kind of like exploitation of the things that we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. I would echo that for a second. Great. I have a question. But we'll go one, two, and then we might want to talk about one because I have a question. Yeah. Can I just echo what you had to say, which is that? You know, in the kind of like in the green business, you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, kind of fake green, and then that mm -hmm. really uh, is destructive as a real green. So if a worker co op can be three co op members and then they hire 50 people, we're all getting them a wage. Is that mm -hmm. something that, you know, that would be a, a big blot on, the, on this movement? Uh, so how do we? You know, is there anything protecting from that? Or? 
Did you tell a lot of this? Yeah, yeah I, no, I, heard that, I just heard that uh, Mondragon in, uh, in Spain uh, has a situation where they have, I think, 80,000 or something um, worker members, but then they also have something like 10 or 20,000 people who are not worker, or are not members, but they're actually workers, so they're employees, and then the question becomes, okay, mm -hmm. how groovy is this really? Uh, and it, and it, could, it, could, it could be flipped in, in, the, in the other direction, which have about 10,000 worker members and 80,000 you know, people that are not members. And then, so how do you mm -hmm. protect against that? Right. Jack Crew on this as well? Or it's a different kind of kind of question that goes back about an hour ago. You mentioned. Um, can I, I'm sorry, can I get an answer this one okay, first? Sorry, sorry. sorry yeah. yeah, we did, like, um, the reason I had so many years is because we were recording the audio, just making sure it's good. But, um, yeah, we did uh, talk about this issue and how to incorporate it into the law, and we just, like, turned it over, like, should we create um, something in the law that says that there can be a candidacy period, that there's a proportional amount of workers to worker members, and that if you're above a certain amount of percentage, like you just stated, like, three worker owners, and then... 50 just employees, um, then they would uh, not become a worker cooperative or something, or somebody can basically bring suit against it and whatever, right? So, but it was very difficult to actually put that into words and say, like, how do we, how do we retain the values of worker ownership, um, worker cooperatives, at the same time giving flexibility for businesses that grow very fast and try to, and maybe they don't have, like, the onboarding process that other companies have, um, you know, and it takes them longer to basically create more work, like to onboard worker owners. So, so that it was a discussion that we definitely had in the last iteration of this bill, and it was just so complicated that I think we decided to leave it out because we couldn't come to an agreement on what the, the language would be. So, it sort of raises the red flag. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think sorry. Yeah. Only, uh, I do want to speak it directly to that. I've been trying to think through um, who the other forty nine percent are and what rights they have and you know, what what are they doing in this process. So uh, are they participating in in some way in uh, in uh, distribution? Are they they're voting apparently? Uh, and it seems to be if they're voting in the same kind of class of voters. Uh, it would, how does that ask your question? Would they have a separate number of seats on the board or they're voting for the whole board? If they're voting for the whole board, it seems really easy to abuse that by combining with the you know, mm -hmm. folks that are already there uh, and, and spending an election. Um, and, uh, and then where are they in a, in a dissolution or in any other kind of distribution of assets? Because that's where it gets dangerous. And, 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 Mm -hmm. Come radio. Mm -hmm. Would you even want to vote option three then? Well, that's where I'm coming from. I'm mm -hmm. willing to think about the other one. This needs an answer. So, before yeah. we kind of dig into this one, do you have a point back on well, here before we even? Maybe just to argue against myself. Yeah. Just to <laughs> flesh it out a little bit. The, the, you know, I don't think it's, I think, okay. I think it's, um, I hear what Susie was saying around, uh, you know, trying, trying to be incremental about this, this disability for what we call town and build, uh, build your way towards creating more rules and restrictions around the definition of what constitutes what we call up and uh, current, the current, the way that we're currently most of us have formed this, this co-ops doesn't address these, these fundamental questions around wage differentials or proportion of memberships, uh, and this, this continues not to do that as well, but it perhaps just moves us in the correct direction towards getting there eventually. And then and, and, and then just to put the, what Ricardo was saying into real terms, like the Freestone Half, a new member of Norwalk and Water Power, they grew very, very, very quickly from five owner members and a couple of employee dishwashers really, you know, genuinely thinking, how can we make this as a, a real worker co-op? Um, and at the same time as they're growing very quickly, and uh, and now have, now we're up to 15 uh, worker members, 30 employees, with the goal of getting there. But at the same time, 
this not uh, like uh, onboarding a whole ton of people without having them aware of the rights and responsibilities of, of ownership. So just to put that the real you know, in the real light scenario. <laughs> We also have struggled with seasonal employees in the business cycle that worker clause may have, and we're really reluctant to put something into the law that would restrict worker clause from being able to have their own business cycles and decide when they're going to have a seasonal employee or not. I support that because I have two scenarios, and one of them is a little secret because a bookstore, say I work at a bookstore, <laughs> it makes no money. So we have, you know, it's a situation where ideally everyone would be paid full and for many hours a week that the people that walk into the door. So I like the flexibility, otherwise that business model would not exist. It's not whitewashing at all. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an institution that beyond just some books. Whereas Rainbow, we would be a bad cooperative because we make money. You know, we didn't try to get everyone as a worker. So there's there's definitely differences between the two, large differences. Mm -hmm. I appreciate not being super strict. Okay. Tim. Um, yeah, I share the concern about it being abused. I mean. That's a problem we're aiming for, to be so attractive that other people want to sound like us. So that's a good one to have. Um, but we're kind of working towards that in a way. And I kind of I brought this concern up before, and I thought a reasonable response to that was, well, we need to get a streamlined bill, because our prior iterations were pretty you know, complex. So that made it harder to pass. And then if we create this thing and other people are attracted to it, including some people who want to use it, then we can go back to legislature and say, oh, here's the problem with this, and this is why we need a stricter definition at this point. Um, I do think is needing some flexibility is good because there are really legitimate reasons to having outside investors, for instance. Um, so there are nonprofits, for instance, that sometimes bring co-ops and they're putting a lot of community money in and they want to make sure that the money doesn't just get dissolved and taken by the people currently there. So they want to own a share, because sure, that's really the only effective way to keep it from mutualizing. So that's a legitimate purpose. Uh, the association I'm part of, actually, we had to create our Netflix to co-ops with equity from the association, so we create a member share from them. So that's a hybrid, and we wouldn't have gotten bank loan for those individual members to get a loan to start up a business if we didn't. So I think there are some legitimate reasons to have these other classes. The other thing I would point out is that the current statute is really open to these kind of things. There's no definitions at all. If I want to create investors, I just have to create an investor class and say they're members and they have voting rights. Right. They probably have equal voting rights, and I could even make them a member class and have a veto power over everything else. So <coughs> it's not like we are going to come up with a certain statute that's not open to abuse, and the current statute is really open to abuse. Um, mm -hmm. So we're trying to actually create more some, some ideal practices and say, if you follow these, you can call yourself a worker co-op. Because mm -hmm. the difference with the present statute doesn't allow non-members to be part of the cooperative, and I share your concerns about and the concerns I mentioned about the 49%, especially if they see their interest as being singular and the workers are divided. That means they essentially have control. And I, I, my other concern is that what you're doing also is there may be also legitimate reasons for, you know, for having this, but there also may be illegitimate reasons. And unfortunately, I'm a litigator and I usually see the illegitimate stuff. You know, that, that's where people gravitate towards. So, um, I think it, it allows itself to be abused and allows it the, the whole concept of, you know, what a cooperative is, beginning with Rochdale, to be diluted by allowing this type of inclusion of people who really do not share the same interests, the same concerns, and may even have competing interests. Great. And so we're on the same, yes. on this, okay, so I'm just going to, what, is that too? Okay, so can we just, when we're having this conversation yeah. now, cool, we're all on the same? Great. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Just one other thing about this uh, this particular slide, it doesn't say anything about employee. Uh, so that's a worker who's not a member of the co-op. I mean, it has the you know the class of the mm -hmm. um, of all the other investors, consumers, nonprofits, blah blah blah. But um, it's not going to be that every day at all. It will never be an appropriate statute. Okay. It just won't be there. Finish your question, though. Yeah. Well, well, the question is. 
um, kind of why not, and I'm just trying to, you know, figure out how to, to avoid the abuse situation. <laughs> you know, you have a uh, you know, group of uh, uh, worker co-op members who may have founded the thing, but then 10, 15 years later, you know, there's only, you know, a small number of them left, and, you know, it's all employees and everything mm -hmm. employed. Mm -hmm. So then, again, it would take the whole movement of the yeah. black out. Has this ever happened, like, ever? No, no, but we okay. were trying no, to take no, no, the picture. Okay. The, uh, the plywood co-op, or the plywood industry is to be controlled by worker co-ops. So they start out with, like, all these worker owners, and then they let the market value determine what your buy-in was. So that right. would become a half million dollars to buy in. So you would end up with, like, three people and 500 employees. So it certainly has happened. Mm -hmm. It's not a cur mm -hmm. current common problem, but it's something we certainly can't anticipate. Yeah. Some people would argue, though, that that's still a cooperative, and, and the, the, the figures regarding the underground are actually even worse than you said. Like the, <laughs> the proportion of employees is mm -hmm. even higher. Some people would say, well, that's still a co-op. It's not what we would consider an ideal co-op. Um, and it's also important to understand that you can't just take that money and take uh, their earnings and distribute it to yourselves and taking it. You have to declare that as money that's just generated by the employees, not profit, and you have to pay taxes on it. So it's not like they would create this benefit because they wanted to get a bunch of employees to exploit them, take their labor any way that any way that they couldn't already do under any other law, including the current statute. I mean, the current statute. I I, I don't want us to get us too bogged down into a, a, any potential disagreement between me and you, but the, the thing I think we'll probably agree on is under the current statute, you can do all these things. You could even create a corporation that was made up of LLCs and call it co-op. You don't even have to have an actual person. I can make, yeah. I can have investors, and I just call the members, and I give them voting rights, and they, I can give them as many voting rights as I want to. So certainly the statute we're talking about is an improvement over those things, 25%. Mm -hmm. So you, you, we've got you and I sit his hand, and yeah, there's no space right there. Go. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so part of the... Our goal here is actually to create a statute, see what tap, see what happens. If there is abuse of a statute, then correct it. And I totally agree with Tim is that if we, if we it would be great if we actually had a problem to talk about where worker co-ops became such a big thing in such a desirable form that people wanted to abuse them. I don't think we're anywhere near there right now. Um, and uh, I I'm pushing more for the middle option. Um, because I think that what I don't like about option one is by distributing patronage to different classes of members, I think you have the potential to open yourself up to um, more disagreements and confusion with regard to the tax law and also the internal dynamics of the co-op itself having many patronage member classes. So when you focus patronage just on the worker members and then allow for other types of membership, for example, preferred members who are just investors with no voting rights. Um, Option two would allow for that. I think option one is option three is overly restrictive with regard to only having one class of members and not even allowing for, for example, preferred uh, shareholders in the co-op, which I think can be a really powerful instrument to use. And a lot of startup worker co-ops are using that through this DPL direct public offering process, which that would probably block them off from using it. Great. Terry and then Mark. As a um, <coughs> an investor, I would feel very secure having a board seat. I mean, I've been on a lot of boards, and that's not necessarily a lot of power um, to protect yourself. I would I would be much more interested in, in um, uh, the contractual arrangement for holding my money and and what leverage I have. I might be interested in board seat just to get the information of what's actually going on in the corporation. <laughs> Uh, on the inside. When uh, we started Harris Mendy, um, Tim knows better than I, um, we were quite concerned not to have power dissipated from the worker group. And so we used a lot of uh, debt equity, went to friends and neighbors and borrowed money uh, to avoid that. And we were fortunate enough in our planning and in our operation that we, within a year, could take out that debt equity from friends and, and go to a bank and, and get a get a loan. I don't know how how reasonable it is to to seek that kind of situation either for the bank or some other 
uh, group of investors uh, and, and deal with it on a contractual basis rather than a ownership uh, basis. And it, it's, it's an open question. I don't, I'm not really bringing anything to that question except the curiosity. Um, maybe Tim can help me with that. Um, certainly, it can be done that way. Um, having voting rights inside the co-op could be an effective way to do it. Uh, it actually brings up a, a, a later point, which is that if you want to, um, you can have a, a co-op that you define as democratic as you want, and then you can have a contract that actually gives a bunch of people outside more power than the workers do. So, no matter how clever the attorneys that we have writing it are, you can always find an attorney who's going to say, oh, well, you say that when you have this many workers, well, then we're just going to create a subcorporation and put all those other employees over here. So we can write our ideal thing, but there are definitely going to be other mechanisms to give other people control. Um, and we'll hopefully have that problem and be able to work against that problem as we see it defined now. But um, I... I also do prefer not to have uh, people who are essentially uh, part of multi-sectoral co-ops and other people have more control be calling themselves worth the co-ops. I call just calling them multi-sectoral co-ops. And I really don't think that the, even when you have those other classes, that they should have voting rights over anything but their property rights. So they shouldn't actually be sitting on the board and making governance decisions. Otherwise, they should just be as a class and members have voting rights over, say, the dissolution of the property. Like, Develop, you know, deregulating into a non-co-op, for instance. So that's that's another option in between one and two. I guess. Okay. Yeah. So you are advocating voting four point five. I suppose because because you know, like saying fifty-one percent of the voting power even on the board doesn't really mean that the workers have even have control because you could define that assumes that there's majority control of the board rather than two-thirds vote to where that you need a pool. You need consensus, and you can have one person on the board who's not a worker and they can have control. So we can't assume too many of those things, and we can't actually take into account every possible piece of writing the statute. That's why you get these statutes that are 300 pages long, is because some lawyers out there coming up with abuses and another lawyers trying to fix that hole and stuff like that. So, um, but I think if we say um, that the voting, the other members, if they're going to call themselves a worker, worker co-op, the other members can't have voting rights except for their property rights. To me, that retains what the value of a worker co-op is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I can understand other investors, community investors, having a vote, but they shouldn't be actually governing the actual worker party. Mm -hmm. So, so it speaks to my question. I uh, guess it's just to show the advocated option too. And that's the one that I'm kind of interested in digging into a little bit more. So, uh, having the, the the other classes of members not being allowed patronage dis distributions. Two, two, two points to that then. Uh, what does it mean to be an investor in that context? Uh, how are investors accessing um, rewards for, for, for their investment? And and then uh, could, there, could we uh, add a line into that second clause of option to something like uh, they, but they are allowed to have limited voting rights? Uh, pertaining to dissolution or uh, the way that their investment is used. I, I'm not, you know, I'm just thinking of a feed, but something that addresses that. Mm -hmm. that Neil, David, or, sorry, Neil, Ray, Jeffrey. I, I, yeah, actually you have to kind of exemplify one of the points I was trying to make is the complications which are added by adding only with the security provisions, so I stand on that point there. But, what I'm really addressing right now is there's been a lot of talk about labor, labor law, employees, what is, what isn't. <laughs> and I have seen firsthand what happens when you don't get it right. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm presently representing parties who maybe make twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year who've been assessed over a million and a half. And it's the closest thing I've ever seen to the 1936 Moscow trials. Um, <laughs> you know, if my only recourse right now, by the way, is against EDD, and I filed a federal suit against it for violation of due process under the Fourteenth Amendment. But the point is, once you're in their grips, it, it, you have hell to pay. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that a lot of people are doing things wrong now in terms of what they're classifying as an employee, what filings they're making, regards that. The reason I'm bringing that up is because we cannot address that issue in this statute. Mm -hmm. in this statute. We, it takes us back to the strategy. So what is a strategy? Is a strategy one that really benefits cooperatives 
in terms of their present needs and works up the things that they need, like labor law, or once again, is it going to be going around in circles because we want to add things that make us feel good that maybe don't do too much? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Jeff. Okay. I guess I like option two because mm -hmm. um, I imagine the investor will get a percentage back. I mean, that's what, and mm -hmm. I like, I, not only do I like this, you know, what we're doing here to make clarify, but I like the idea of of a cooperative being more competitive and much like venture capitalists with startups, <clears throat> venture capitalists with startups, they could fizzle out and just the one or two owners of that could get all the money. That's less. However, however, venture capitalists come into this and they see something that is maybe more sustainable and fair and ethical. So it's like I like the idea of being a lot more competitive. So I like option two. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and then we'll go to Emily. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering if there's an option 2.5. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's what this is for, the brain <laughs> right? Where uh, the worker members uh, would have more like 66% of the voting power. I mean, is that something that you guys discuss? Um, just a higher threshold there, you know, again, to push it so that the, the worker owners have, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any response to that? Uh, well, I can respond to a lot of the ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> go, wait, um, go for it. So we just want to bring, create a baseline, a floor mm -hmm. for the state. And we want worker co-ops to decide what voting threshold they want to set above that, if they're going to bring in investors. We don't want to dictate anything more than what we think is the base, which is they should have majority control over the board. Um, the second thing is how do they get investors get any return? Patronage is a return on your labor in this case. Um, patronage is a return on your use of the co-op, not on your capital investment in the co-op. But we can have capital investment, return on capital investment as well under this scheme option too. So that's what investors would get. As a fixed percentage. Yeah, as a fixed percentage. And that percentage act is actually already set in the law. There's a 15% rule in the, in the existing general co-op law. Um, but, but if you oh. have investors, aren't you then going to be required to be subject to security laws where if you, work for, if you have worker members, they can be totally exempt from workers' security laws, especially if they organize themselves on a membership basis? Um, yes. Which part? Oh, the, but what you're saying is right. If yeah. you want to bring in outside investors, you might have to register. Yeah, I mean, you will be subject. Whereas, so which direction are you going? I would prefer to go in the direction that security laws do not apply to cooperatives that are based upon a membership basis. I would, okay, so two things. One is we're not addressing labor law, and we've taken your point very well. No, security law. I'm talking I don't know, I'm saying for your, your yeah. earlier point, we're not mentioning labor law at right, all in this corporate statute. Yeah. Uh, second point is I would like, well, I forgot your name. Remember? Yeah. 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 I want, I would also like to see where your clubs be more competitive. Mm -hmm. And if that means they're going to have outside investors, they're going to hire counsel and do, uh, do offerings and register those as security. But that doesn't mean that the other securities exemptions shouldn't apply to worker members of their own co-op. Yes and no, no, I guess I'm just wondering, um, like, I mean, it seems to me as though option two is kind of the middle of the road and sort of allows, is like most generous on either side. And then if you wanted to, you could sort of figure out some of these like complications that people are bringing up within like bylaws, at least like I'm, I guess I'm, I'm all I'm thinking about is the worker cooperative I'm in and how I would use this. Not really thinking about um, I don't know other terrible people. Right? <laughs> um, so that would be like most helpful to me just to understand like um, like allowing there to be other classes of members. I could also make some kind of clarification in my bylaws that made it so that um, those members, if they are investors or consumers, had maybe like, you know, and like figuring out that voting power within my bylaws and figuring out all these other kind of complications within my bylaws, but it's open to where, yeah, I could have like a competitive edge with, with venture capitalists and inv investors and things like that, but like, um, yeah, I, I would say option two seems like very generous and like 
also, yeah, it gives you that bottom line of board members having most of the voting power. And at least that being covered by like law, should there be some kind of dispute. Okay, I've got Terry and then um, just doing, we're up against seven and then we've got one other conversation and I'm sure you all want to stay right until 730. So um, we take Terry and then if anyone else wants to throw their hand up for this one and then we'll still want to talk to the Yeah. So great, Terry. Okay, uh, if, if there's a cap on the people's base, that's